Psalm 8, to the chief musician on the instrument of Gath, uh, Psalm of David. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength because of your enemies, that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him? and the Son of Man, that you visit him. You have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. All right, uh, let's see here. We're going to do a little bit uh, different tact on our sermon this week. Uh, as we do from time to time, we get out of the book of Exodus. And so we are going to be today in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. I'm going to do the entire chapter, so it's just going to be a snapshot of it. But uh, Ecclesiastes 12, 1 through 14. And uh, this is entitled, The Brevity of Man. All right, uh, Ecclesiastes 12, starting in verse 1. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. Before the difficult days come and the years draw near when you say, I have no pleasure in them. While the sun and the light, the moon and the stars are not darkened and the clouds do not return after the rain. In the day when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men bow down. When the grinders cease because they are few and those that look through the windows grow dim. When the doors are shut in the streets and the sound of grinding is low. When one rises up at the sound of a bird and all the daughters of music are brought low. Also, they are afraid of height and terrors in the way. When the almond tree blossoms, the grasshopper is a burden and desire fails. For man goes to his eternal home and the mourners go about the streets. Remember your creator before the silver cord is loosed or the golden bowl is broken or the pitcher shattered at the fountain or the wheel broken at the well. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher, all is vanity. And moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yes, he pondered and sought out and set in order many proverbs. The preacher sought to find acceptable words, and what was written was upright words of truth. The words of the wise are like goads. And the words of scholars are like well-driven nails given by one shepherd. And further, my son, be admonished by these. Of making many books there is no end, and much study is wearisome to the flesh. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. I take care of a friend's house down the road from where I live. He's a very nice guy who's now 90 years old, the same as our beloved Pat. One day I asked him, hey, Einer, what's your secret to living so long? Simple, he said, I just keep on breathing. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess that helps. The fact is, though, that life is short. I've lost several friends that I grew up with. One day they were there, and the next day they were gone. One of them, as you know, was a member of this church. On a Saturday just one year ago this week, I got a call from her daughter, Sarah. Uncle Charlie... Mom died. I couldn't believe it. I could not process those words. My mind simply went blank. But I just got an email from her yesterday. How can this be true? As each person that knew her heard the news, they had the same sense of shock. And when my mother came to church Sunday morning, she literally broke out weeping. Her sobs crushed what was left of my already shattered heart. For each of us, our memories of Kelly flooded over us like a tidal wave. What was the last thing I said to her? Could I have done more for her or with her? Was I the friend that I should have been? Every one of us had such thoughts. But when the last moment is over, it is over. Life is brief, and for all of us, it is a terminal disease. Each one of us will come to that same end someday. It isn't if, but rather when. Our text verse comes from the book of Job. It's chapter 14. Man who is born of woman is of few days and full of trouble. He comes forth like a flower and fades away. He flees like a shadow and does not continue. Whether we 
like it or not, we're all getting older, moment by moment, day by day. The clock keeps ticking as our life ebbs away. We race towards the future looking for what's ahead, and we're in continuous anticipation about the next big thing. But from time to time, we stop and we look back and we wonder, where have the years gone? Usually we do this on anniversaries and birthdays and times like that. Solomon tells us that this is entirely the wrong attitude to have. If you follow his life, this is exactly what he did, but it ended up costing him. He was the richest and wisest man who ever lived, and yet he misplaced his wisdom. At the end of his life, he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. It's a very hard book to follow unless you understand its very simple premise. He contrasts life under the sun with life under the heavens. He tells us what is and what is not meaningful. In the end, nothing under the sun is meaningful. Instead, it is what is under God's heaven that has true meaning and purpose. This is the point of what Solomon is trying to tell us as he sums up everything in chapter 12 of the book of Ecclesiastes. We can take it as an axiom that no person lying on his deathbed ever uttered these words. I wish I had worked just a couple more hours in my job. No, when we encounter death, we look at things in an entirely different way. For many who are blessed with a slow death, they at least get the chance to sort out their life with God, hopefully. For those who die suddenly, they do not get this chance. They were either right with him or they were not. For those who are not, this is the saddest end of all. If you are here today, it's because you are still alive. Solomon tells you what you need to consider right now. He will open his discourse noting that it is to the youth to whom he is speaking. Now, here's my thought about that. As the oldest man who ever lived was Methuselah, and he lived to 969 years of age, I think every person in this church qualifies as a youth at used in regards to him. So Solomon is speaking to you. Pay attention. There are valuable lessons to be learned from this superior word. And so may God speak to us through his word today, and may his glorious name ever be praised. I have only two thoughts for you today. The first is Solomon's words to the young. The beautiful, even magnificent words of Ecclesiastes chapter 12 comprise 1,482 characters in 339 words of 14 verses in the New King James Version. Or if you read the Hebrew, it's about half of that, 754 characters and only 162 words. Solomon was writing to the youth of his time. And the words he wrote echo down through the ages and throughout all generations. He speaks like Isaiah, who would later come, also speaks about priorities. Isaiah said these words to us. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. But though Solomon's words are beautiful, some of them are a bit cryptic, aren't they? Especially verses 1 through 6. And so let's take a very brief look today at them together to see what Solomon is trying to tell us. Verse 1, remember your creator now in the days of your youth, before the difficult days come and the years draw near when you say, I have no pleasure in them. In these opening words of the chapter, Solomon implores his reader to not wait on a relationship with God. Youth and its many distractions is still the perfect time to begin and to strive to perfect this relationship. With the passing of youth, we experience what he calls the difficult days. They are days of trouble and they are days of trial. First, pressures of family and work come up. And no sooner are we getting through this phase than we reach the age of physical and mental deterioration. Such are the days which are not so distant in the future. Instead, they are days which draw near. And in the coming of that time, we say, I have no pleasure in them. Life loses the wonder of youth. It loses the joy of things being endlessly new and exciting. Instead, it all becomes routine. Life gets tedious and the days get tiresome. The alarm clock rings and we rise to do our duty once again. The excitement is gone, but for brief moments, which are always too short, from time to time, we might even have the passing thought which the psalmist of old asked. He said these words, How many are the days of your servant speaking of himself? 
The pleasure of youth is gone, and in place of it comes questions about when life itself is going to end. Solomon asks us to remember our Creator in our youth before such days arrive. As I've already noted how youthful each one of you here is, then be advised that he is speaking to you. Whatever the span of your life will be, it is set, and there's nothing that you can do about it. Moses understood this, and he wrote something special for us to consider. From the oldest psalm in the Bible, we read these words. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Verse 2, while the sun and the light, the moon and the stars are not darkened. Here Solomon is referring to the loss of vision, macular degeneration, cataracts, and all of the other eye problems that we experience in this fallen world. I personally started losing my vision some years ago. I was about 40. It seems that every year or so since then, the number on my reader glasses gets just a little bit larger. Eventually, if our sight gets bad enough, the sun and the light, the moon and the stars, and all of the other things that we love to see, all of these will simply fade into gray or even into black. But there is another type of blindness that is even worse. It isn't physical at all. Rather, it is spiritual. It is a blindness we are born with. Jesus spoke of it to the leaders of Israel with these words from John chapter 9. And Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may be made blind. Then some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words and said to him, Are we blind also? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say, We see, therefore your sin remains. We have a blindness to our own sinful state. It is so heavy over the eyes of our hearts that we simply refuse to see that it is there. Paul prayed that this blindness would be replaced with clarity of vision. In his letter to the Ephesians, he said this, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but in also that which is to come. Children, we are being asked to remember our creator now. In the days of our youth, before the blindness of eternal darkness once and forever overtakes us. Verse 2 continues, and the clouds do not return after the rain. Actually, the Hebrew reads, and the clouds return after the rain. The clouds returning after the rain is a metaphor for continued physical problems constantly returning. As soon as it rains, the clouds begin to form again. It is a continuous cycle of getting better, only to have the same problem come right back. In the same way, our brains fog over and our thoughts become unclear as we age. Even if we remember something, we forget it right away. Before this sad state comes upon us, Solomon implores us to think on the things of God, to make the best possible use of our time. The psalmist of old gives us wonderful words of how we should spend these few moments of our existence. He says, when I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches. David did just this, and he was able to hide God's word in his heart when he was young. And it was a good thing he did, because later in his years, this would have become impossible. He had an affliction of the body which was so debilitating that he could never have directed his thoughts to the things of God unless they were already instilled in him. Here's what it says about him from 1 Kings chapter 1. When King David was old and well advanced in years, he could not keep warm even when they put covers over him. Solomon saw this in his father, and he wrote words for us to consider. He says, Rejoice, O young man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and in the sight of your eyes, but know that for all these God will bring you into judgment. Verse 3, In the day when the keepers of the house tremble. Here Solomon calls the arms and the legs the keepers of the house. The arms are what care for us, and the legs are what transport us. They are what keep the house of our souls fed, healthy, mobile, and able to keep on functioning. But as humans, we often tend to get the shakes in these areas with age. Body tremors, neuropathic problems, Parkinson's, and other ravages of time and age all cause the keepers of our house to tremble. 
Solomon asks us to consider our lives now in our youth before this happens. It is a sad thought that someone would start to seek God from his word at a time when he can't even hold a book steady. Rather, the book of Hebrews admonishes us with these words, directed to us now while we are still able. It says, Therefore strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated but rather healed. Verse 3 continues, And the strong men bow down. When he says that the strong men bow down, it's obvious that as we age, the ground gets closer to our faces. Or maybe it's our faces are getting closer to the ground. Our backs hunch over, our knees bow, and these unnatural positions only increase our pains. And so I'd ask today that you consider, while you have the chance to strengthen yourself spiritually through Christ, so that when your physical body wears out, you have the inner strength of his glorious spirit to take you through these times of trouble. Two contrasting verses from the Psalms will help instruct us in this matter. The first is from Psalm 31. For my life is spent with grief and my years with sighing. My strength fails because of my iniquity and my bones waste away. And then in Psalm 146, we read the contrast. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. What a different end for those who know God and those who do not. For the first, there is an eternity of strength which awaits them. For the others, there is only an eternity of pain which lies ahead after this life of pain. Remember your creator now, my children. Verse 3 continues. When the grinders cease because they are few. Along with the other problems, Solomon tells us, that our chewing is going to become more difficult with age due to the loss of our pearly whites. We're fortunate today. We have advanced dental capabilities, but the cost is often so high that we will still let some of the missing teeth remain missing. Eventually, for some, there's only the prospect of soft foods for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It was a rare thing in ancient Israel for people to have all of their teeth, even at a young age. How much worse when they were older. Solomon was impressed that his bride-to-be had all of her teeth. Here's what it says. Your teeth are like a flock of shorn sheep, which have come up from the washing, every one which bears its twins, and none is barren among them. His advice to this beautiful young bride who had all of her teeth would have been to enjoy her beauty and to enjoy every meal, but also to pursue God while she was still young enough to possess both. Verse 3 continues. And those that look through the windows grow dim. Again, Solomon reminds us of our coming vision problems. The eyes are called the windows to the soul. Eventually, the eyes dim and the food for our soul can no longer be consumed. His advice is that we not get to that point without first remembering our Creator, pondering Him and His goodness in our lives. Some of the greatest of the Bible actually suffered with vision problems. Isaac, the great patriarch, lay in his bed for over 40 years because of blindness. Eli, the high priest of Israel and one of the very few people in all of human history to ever see the most holy objects of Israel's tabernacle, eventually lost his vision as well. Moses was more fortunate. It says this of him at his death. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eyes were not dim nor his natural vigor diminished. For those who are the redeemed of the Lord, who are willing to follow him, Many promises are made, including promises of sight to the blind. Here's what it says in Isaiah 42. I will bring the blind by a way they did not know. I will lead them in paths they have not known. I will make darkness light before them and crooked places straight. These things I will do for them and not forsake them. Remember your creator now before the times of eternal darkness arrive and sight is no longer possible. Verse 4. When the doors are shut in the streets and the sound of grinding is low. The doors of which Solomon speaks are our ears. When we shut the doors to the streets outside, we can't hear what's happening out there. But that is where the joy of life is. The sound of the grinding speaks of the women sitting at the millstones, chatting like birds and grinding out the grain for the evening meal. It would have been the most common and delightful sound of all. Every Israelite would cherish the memories of such times. To not hear more of them would have been worse than almost anything else. Likewise, the music that we love, the voice of our loved ones, and the sounds of life will all fade with age. With our bad eyes, we can't read the Bible, and with our bad ears, we can't even hear an audio Bible. 
Solomon would ask us to consider our Creator now, before such evil days steal away our chance to know Him intimately. For those who know their Lord, He can and He will cause the deaf to hear. Mark wrote this about the marvelous work of Jesus Christ there on the dusty streets of Israel. Then they brought to him one who was deaf and had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to put his hand on him. And he took him aside from the multitude and put his fingers in his ears, and he spat and touched his tongue. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. Immediately his ears were opened, and the impediment of his tongue was loosed, and he spat spoke plainly, which I can't do. Then he commanded them that they should tell no one. But the more he commanded them, the more widely they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He makes both the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. Christ does all things well because he is the God-man. He is the one who promised restoration of all things, and through him all things will be restored. Solomon finishes this verse with this thought. Verse 4 going on, when one rises up at the sound of a bird and all the daughters of music are brought low. Man, he tends to wake up earlier as he ages, with or without an alarm clock. I get up every single morning without an alarm clock at 4.30. Sometimes it's 4.20. The daughters of music are the morning birds which sing their joyous songs. But despite their marvelous sounds, there's a big problem. We may be up early as they sing out their delightful tunes, but we can't hear them because our hearing is shot. The daughters of music are all brought low. Their joyous whistling becomes nothing more than a dull sound to our deadened ears. And there's also another type of deafness which man faces. It is the inability to hear the word of God as it speaks to his soul. The Lord told the prophet Isaiah to proclaim this to the people. Go and tell this people, keep on hearing but do not understand. Keep on seeing but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and return, and be healed. The people of Isaiah's time are the same as people today. We refuse to listen, we refuse to heed, and we refuse to turn and be healed. The musical notes of the words of Scripture are brought low to our deadened sense. Oh God, if we would just open our hearts you would fill our ears with sound and our eyes with light. From Exodus 4, So the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? Have not I, the Lord? Verse 5, And they are afraid, also they are afraid of height. The young are afraid of nothing. Heights are a challenge to be overcome. But to the elderly, even a small stepladder could mean a broken hip. High places begin to terrify, and the ground is a safe haven from those terrifying heights. But even the old who know the Lord, who cherish their Creator in the days of their youth, are able to rise to the highest of heights to grant Him His just due. It says in the 148th Psalm, Praise the Lord! Praise the Lord from the heavens! Praise Him in the heights! Verse 5 going on, And terrors in the way. What was once something that we laughed off without a care? later becomes that which terrifies us the most. When we were young, we would go to the store without a second thought. But with age comes fear. Will someone attack me if I go out? Those young ruffians on the corner there sure look bent on evil. What if the car breaks down on the highway? The things that never caused us a moment of concern eventually fill us with dread. Age has worn us down and we can no longer look out for ourselves as we once did. Like a lazy person, we soon find excuses to not go out at all. Here's what it says about the lazy person. The lazy man says, there is a lion outside. I shall be slain in the streets. But for those who fear the Lord in reverence, there is no dread of what man, demon, or devil can do. Here's what it says in the 23rd Psalm. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Verse 5 going on. When the almond tree blossoms, when it's in full bloom, the almond tree is covered with white blossoms. Solomon uses it as a metaphor for the head of the aged. Where there once was raven black, there is now beautiful gray. Where blonde curls were, there's now shiny silver. Solomon is being poetic and he's being striking about the head of the aged. My beard used to be a nice brown color, didn't it? Now it's assumed another look. In the Proverbs, Solomon says, For those who took the time to know their creator in their youth, the blossoming almond tree bears a special honor. 
Here's what he says. The silver haired head is a crown of glory if it is found in the way of righteousness. And in Isaiah, the Lord promises his people that this mark of the aged is no hindrance to his power. He says, even to your old age, I am he. And even to gray hairs, I will carry you. I have made and I will bear. Even I will carry and will deliver you. Verse five going on, the grasshopper is a burden. God created the grasshopper just like he created mosquitoes. For the aged, both are troubling. In the case of the grasshopper, even though their ears have the trouble of hearing the sound of the birds, the grasshopper's song at night is as clear as crystal because of its peculiar pitch. Even someone practically deaf can hear it. And it never seems to end as you lie in your bed with your old bones wishing that it were morning. The grasshopper just drags himself along, robbing the aged of the little sleep that they try to get. Remember your creator now in the time of your youth before such terrible times come. Verse 5 going on, and desire fails. What was once delightful becomes bland. What was once stirring of the soul eventually becomes wearisome. Work loses its joy. The desires of life fade. The anticipation of the caress of another is replaced with the desire to just get a little bit more sleep. Ouch. That's all I can say. In this regard, Moses was a blessed exception. Same verse I read earlier. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eyes were not dim, nor his natural vigor diminished. The Hebrew of this verse tells us that Moses did not need Viagra. But for the majority of us, as age advances, our desires fail and the joys of our youth are gone. Remember your creator now in the days of your youth, young man. Verse 5 continues. For man goes to his eternal home the eternal home, the resting place for all souls. The King James Version calls it the long home, and we will be there a long, long time. For us, there awaits a box in the ground, a fancy pine overcoat longer than it is wide. Verse 5 continues, and the mourners go about the streets. In the time of Solomon, and even through the time of Jesus, professional mourners were employed to stand outside of homes and wail for people who had died. If you were wealthy, you'd have a whole bunch of them. But whatever, the job could only mean one thing. Death had arrived and claimed another soul. The eternally hungry pit was fed once again, and the sound of a person unique from any other in all of human history had been forever silenced. Solomon asks us to consider this end, for it is one that we will all share in. For those who are wise, there is to be relief from this pit, if, if, we will just remember our creator before the sickle comes to reap the sheaf of our life. In Christ, there is hope. Here's what it says in John chapter 11. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Verse six, remember your creator before the silver cord is loosed. Once again, Solomon implores us to remember him, the one who loves us, who created us, who came to die for us. Before we know it, something will go wrong with our, our jar of clay, our human shell, and it will be too late. The silver cord is the spine and its marrow. Its loosening causes a stopping of all the nervous system and brings on the approach of old age and death. Or if it gets cut unnaturally, death can be much, much quicker. Remember him now before your silver cord is loosed. Verse 6 going on, or the golden bowl is broken. The golden bowl is our head and its contents, or lack thereof. If it gets broken or the brain pops a vessel, we're on our way to the checkout counter. Our ticket is punched. I've known several people who have died from head injuries. Some of them have died on motorcycles. One more recently, our dear friend Kelly died of a brain hemorrhage. To think of these people is to miss them. Even with modern medicine, once the golden bowl is broken, that's pretty much it. Solomon would have us use our head now in the pursuit of God while it can still be used for such a magnificent pursuit. There are brains there, but is there wisdom to use them? Verse 6 continues, or the pitcher shattered at the fountain. The pitcher is that great vein which carries blood to the right ventricle of the heart, here called the fountain. The pitcher pours, the fountain receives. Life continues on with each pump of the muscle. But the pump is known to fault. The vein is known to shatter. And the fountain no longer receives the lifeblood of the man. Verse 6 continues. 
or the wheel broken at the well. The wheel is the great artery which receives the blood from the left ventricle of the heart, here designated as the well. Modern science has the capacity to repair these things to some extent, don't they, Paul? But eventually they will wear out unless something else goes first. When the wheel is broken, the cowboy has had his last roundup. The surfer is tucked into his last tube and the mason has laid his last brick. Remember the creator now while the work of your hands remains an active task and not a forgotten memory. Of verse 6, I'd like to tell you a quick story. I used to sit on the beach and I did it every single day for years. I had a sign that said, Bible questions answered. Don't be shy. One day a doctor from Pennsylvania walked up and he asked a few questions. He went to church, but he figured all religions were kind of the same. He was up for Buddhism and he was up for new agey things. And eventually he had some question or another and I took him to this verse right here. And I showed him Solomon's words about the heart which are written here. He turned whiter than his already Philadelphia whiteness demanded. And he said, how could he know this? How could Solomon have known this 2,700 years ago? That doctor went away a changed man with a new appreciation for the word of God. Verse 7, then the dust will return to the earth as it was. These words find their origin in the very first pages of the Bible. It is an echo of what God did to Adam. It says there, and the Lord God formed the man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. From the dust we arose at the work of the Lord. By his breath, the dust was animated. The blood began to flow, air filled the lungs, the senses came alive. By his wisdom, it came to be. But by our folly, what was meant to last forever in pristine running condition became a confining prison filled with pains, sadness, and decay. The man forgot his creator and man has suffered ever since. Here's what it says in Genesis chapter 3. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. But through Christ a new body is promised, one that will never wear out, it will never tire, it will never decay. God has spoken. The second shall replace the first. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The first man was of the earth made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And we have borne the image of the man of dust. We shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. That is conditional on your position with Jesus Christ. If you're not in Christ, you'll remain dust for eternity. We are given a choice. Will we stay in Adam and face eternal decay? Or will we choose God's work in Christ and receive eternal life? How will you choose? Choose wisely, my children. Verse 7 continues, And the Spirit will return to God who gave it. Yes, we are eternal beings. Scripture makes it clear that our spirit will return to God. When we meet him, it will be for eternal salvation or it will be for eternal condemnation. A price must be paid for the life that we have lived. It can be paid on the cross of Calvary as our perfect substitute or it can be paid in our imperfect selves. I pray that you make the right choice. The Bible shows a different end for those who are in Christ and those who are not in Christ. From Revelation 3, verse 5, He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Good news there. Here comes the bad news, folks. Revelation 20, Then I saw a great white throne in him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each according to his own works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Verse 8, vanity of vanities, says the preacher, all is vanity. Havel, havelim, amer, hakohelet, hakohavel. Vapor of vapors, says the kohelet. Everything is vapor. Breath on a cold day, that's what this word means, havel. It's the same as the name of Abel. Abel, or Havel, was given his name from a mother who realized the difference between life under the sun and life under the heavens. 
She longed desperately to return to that life under the heavens, which she had lost, but it never came about. She is still waiting 6,000 years later. Without a doubt, outside of Jesus Christ, it is all meaningless. All our money, all our treasures, hard work, savings, relationships, desires, aims, goals, boastings, all of it, vapor. It will pass away and disappear into the nothingness from which it came. James understood this. He wrote this for us. Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but let the rich in his humiliation, because as a flower of the field, he will pass away. For no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat than it withers the grass. Its flower falls and the beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man will also fade away in his pursuits. Our second thought today is the conclusion of the whole matter. It's verses 9 through 14. Verse 9. And moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yes, he pondered and sought out and set in order many proverbs. The Lord came to Solomon in a dream at night and asked him what he desired. His answer was a wise one indeed. Now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king instead of my father David, but I am a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in, and your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people too numerous to be numbered or counted. Therefore, give to your servant an understanding heart to judge your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? The Lord's response to this request came immediately, and it overflowed with abundance. Because you have asked this thing, and have not asked long life for yourself, nor have you asked riches for yourself, nor have you asked the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern justice, Behold, I have done according to your words. See, I have given you a wise and understanding heart so that there has not been anyone like you before you, nor shall any like you arise after you. And I have also given you what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be anyone like you among the kings all your days. So if you walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. In the next chapter, the fulfillment of this promise is recorded. And God gave Solomon wisdom and exceedingly great understanding and largeness of heart like the sand on the seashore. Thus Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the men of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt. For he was wiser than all men, than Ethan the Ezraite and Heman, Kalko and Darda, the sons of Mahol. And his fame was in all the surrounding nations. He spoke 3,000 proverbs and his songs were 1,005. Also, he spoke of trees from the cedar tree of Lebanon, even to the hyssop that springs out of the wall. He spoke also of animals, of birds, of creeping things, and of fish. And men of all nations, from all the kings of the earth who had heard of his wisdom, came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Despite all that he was given, though, he piddled his life away with worthless pursuit of life under the sun. In his old age, he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes in hopes that we would pay heed to what he had ignored. This life is vain indeed, my son. Look to the eternal. Set your eyes on the Lord and run the race with vigor all the way to the finish line. Don't look to the right. Don't look to the left. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Verse 10, the preacher sought to find acceptable words and what was written was upright words of truth. Solomon's personal life was wasted in the empty pursuit of vapor but his words were exceedingly wise. In his case, we could rightly state the old adage, do as I say, not as I do. His words were acceptable even for inclusion into the word of God. What is made clear here is that knowledge is important, but equally so we need to impart it to others. The knowledge of Christ is their only hope. So don't keep it to yourself. As with everything in the Bible, Solomon says that these are just the right words. They are upright and true, they are the words of your creator reaching out to you. As it says in Hebrews concerning all of scripture, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. If this is true, and it is, then the power of the word of God, if properly presented, will cut through all barriers. And the power of the gospel can restore even the greatest sinner. But Paul asks an obvious question in the book of Romans. How then shall they call on him in who they have not believed? 
And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? Wisdom is receiving and applying the word of God to one's life. Exceeding wisdom is turning around and sharing it with others. Verse 11, the words of the wise are like goads. Goads are prods that are used to get animals to move along. In this, Solomon is saying that the words of the wise are what prompt us toward God in an everlasting relationship with him. And the words of the wise are thus the words of scripture. They are what prod us towards a good and a happy end. The Apostle Paul found that kicking against the goads was painful indeed on the day that he met the risen Christ. Here's what it says. And when he had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Are you here today kicking against the goads? You're only hurting yourself. Christ is calling for you to live at peace with him, not to fight his marvelous hand until the day of your death. Let the words of Christ be that which drive you to the refuge where the Lord God dwells and underneath are the everlasting arms. Verse 11 continues, and the words of the scholars are like well-driven nails. A well-driven nail holds fast. You ever tried to pull one out with your hand? It ain't happening. It will remain secure in the highest of winds and against the strongest of intruders. The home is safe. The tent stands firm. The bleachers won't buckle when the nails are well-driven. The words of scholars, wise and learned men who have penned the word of God for us are like this. They are tested and they are true. This is why the psalmist could unequivocally state this. Your word, Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. Later in the same psalm, he gives us another insight into the nature of the word. He says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. A lamp is used to direct light, but light is constant. It never changes. It travels at 186,282 miles per second, always. The word of God is what directs the light, and the light of the word never changes. The path for our feet will never falter when we place our trust in the contents of this word. Let these well-driven nails be your place of refuge now, while the time is called today. Verse 11 continues, given by one shepherd. Who is this one shepherd? It is Jesus, the eternal logos, the word of God. He is both the author and the subject of the Bible. The words he gives us are all we need to properly guide our lives and to lead us into all righteousness. In adhering to his words, we are forever filled. Psalm 23, verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And the shepherd that David looked on high to is the same shepherd that we eagerly anticipate. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. He is our good shepherd. He's our great shepherd and he is our chief shepherd. He is the guide of the flock and his reward is with him. His word stands firm and his promises are true. Remember him now, little children. Seek him while he may be found. Verse 12, and further, my son, be admonished by these. We can seek wisdom from a thousand cultures and from 10,000 wise men. But unless we pursue God as he has revealed himself to us, then the wisdom will fail and our knowledge will die with us. The words of the scholars which have been given by the one true shepherd have been provided as the roadmap for our lives. He created us and therefore he alone can direct us as is fit and proper. Solomon understood this and his words to you, my children, are as relevant today as they were when he said this. Allow the word of God to admonish you. Demonstrate true wisdom now, now while there's time. Verse 12 continues, of making many books, there is no end, and much study is wearisome to the flesh. Isn't this the truth? Imagine Solomon wrote this almost 3,000 years ago. He said even then that there is no end to the making of books at a time in history when hardly any books had been written. Just imagine how overwhelming a sight of a modern library would be for that guy or the internet. If we were to count only the books written about the Bible, we would be counting a very, very long time. I know several people, quite a few in fact, who have read book after book after book after book about the Bible, but they have spent very little time in comparison simply reading the Bible. What a waste of time. Before I met the Lord, I read the entire collection of Edgar Allan Poe every single year, every year 
year after year. And since I met him, I have never read Poe again. And in all honesty, I'd rather go back and read Poe than most of the books that have been written about the Bible. They come and they go. They often enrich the author, but they do very little to enrich the soul. At least Edgar Allan Poe could do that. If you want time well spent, the word is waiting. Pick the thing up and read it. If you do, you will be able to fulfill the words of the next verse. Verse 13, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Oh boy, I can't wait to hear this. Solomon, the wisest man ever to live in human history, has some advice for us, for you, my children. Now, while still in your youth, lean in and listen, folks. As our friend Kelly Carlin used to say, the word is near you. Verse 13 continues, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. Truly, it is the whole duty of man to fear God, to obey his holy word, and to fix our eyes on Jesus. And how do we keep his commandments? Well, first you have to learn them, right? Which ones apply still? Which ones are set aside? The commandments of God throughout the ages are many, but not all apply at all times. The ones that do now are neither burdensome nor are they difficult. To find out this fact, though, you need to go to the source and you need to read it. Immerse yourself in the Bible. It is an amazingly deep well. So drink from it daily and then obey it in the context which applies for those who have trusted in the grace of Jesus Christ. Solomon says that this is man's all. There is no greater thing that we as human beings can do than to have a reverential fear of God and to keep the word which he has given to us. Shall we stand before him approved on that great day? If we adhere to the precepts of the Bible, the answer is yes. Verse 14 finishes with these words, For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. A day of reckoning is coming. We will all face it, and there is not a thing that we can do about it. We can deny it. We can suppress it. We can lie to ourselves about it. But that day will come. For each and every soul who has ever existed, on that day the secrets of our heart will be exposed and the hidden things will be brought to light. The old saying, nothing is sure but death and taxes, that underestimates the ability of people to finagle their way out of paying taxes. But one thing we can't cheat is death. We're all heading to our long home, and we do not know the day that we are going to move into it. The time is coming when we will all stand before God to give an account of ourselves. We will stand and receive judgment based on our words. As Jesus said, by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. The words that Jesus Christ wants to hear and the words that justify us are laid out by Paul in the book of Romans. Here's what he said, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Let me explain to you how you can arrive at that point where you are willing to utter those words. We have sin. It's in us. It infects us, and as I said, there's a blindness to our sin. We don't want to admit it. We don't want to admit that we have a disconnect from our Heavenly Father because of what is called sin. And because He's infinite and because we're finite, there is an infinite disconnect between us. We can't go back in time and undo what we have done, and so we're infinitely separated from our Heavenly Father. And that's why He stepped out of the infinite realm and He united with human flesh in the womb of Mary, and He lived the perfect life that you and I cannot live. He didn't inherit his father's sin. He never sinned under the law of God, which was given for the people of Israel. And then he gave his life up in an exchange. I am going to do this for the people that I created, that I love so much, that if they will just simply believe, if they will simply believe that I am giving my life up in exchange for their sins, their sin will be removed. Now, that's the easiest thing in the world. I accept that Jesus Christ died for my sins, and yet it is the most difficult thing that any person can ever do because you have to say, I am going to put myself aside, and I'm not going to try to merit God's favor any longer. I'm just simply going to reach out, and I'm going to receive what God did for me because you can't fix it anyway. And so the only way to get it fixed is to set your pride aside and to let Jesus Christ richly fill you with his justification and his atonement through his shed blood. And God proved it. The most documented event in all of ancient history, the most documented, is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We have that sure proof, and we have thousands of copies of texts that prove this, and they're 
written, many of them right within the lifespan of the people that saw him and that saw that occur. Most of the things that we teach in high schools are written eight and 900 years later. And they call them eyewitness account and they teach them as if they're doctrine. And yet it's just stuff that people wrote. And yet we have the absolute truth of God's word. And we have the things like I showed you during the prophecy update, the chiasms and the acrostics, which are so intricately tied into the Bible that no man, no computer on earth could ever do what we find day to day. What Sergio found this week is impossible for a human being to do. And yet it's right there if we're willing to say, I will trust God because his word is sure that his son came out of the grave and that I want what he did. I sinned. I need a savior. You are saved. Proclaim it with your mouth and come up and enjoy the Lord's table with the rest of us. I have a closing verse for you today from 1 Peter chapter 1. It's verses 24 and 25. All flesh is grass and the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers and the flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. Next week, we're going to be back in Exodus. It's uh, great stuff here. We're getting back into some of the, the temple uh, tabernacle furniture. Exodus 30 verses 1 through 10. The symbolism of Christ in these verses is immense. It's entitled the altar of incense. That'll be our 83rd Exodus sermon. And I'll tell you this, that the Lord has you exactly where he wants you. He has a good plan and a purpose for you. Though life under the sun may be exceedingly sorrowful and tedious, he promises those who trust in him a glorious future of life under the heavens. So follow him and trust him, and he will do marvelous things for you and through you. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this marvelous, this stupendous word which you have given us, which points every word of it, every word of it to our coming Lord, our Christ, our Savior, our Messiah, Jesus. Thank you for that, and thank you that you did what we cannot do for ourselves, and by just a simple act of faith, the spurring of our heart and the acknowledgement of our mouth that we want what Christ did, that we have eternity with you. I miss Kelly Carlin immensely. I miss her every time I walk to this pulpit and see her picture, and I miss her throughout the week, but I know that she is there in your presence underneath are the everlasting arms and that I will be there someday and see her as well. And I pray that each person in this room and every person that's on YouTube will get the chance to meet her and to enjoy eternity with her just as I will. This is what our hope is. This is what we wish for, Lord, is to be in your presence and to fellowship with the saints of all of the ages and to get to know everybody. We've got eternity to do it. Might as well start by just acknowledging them that there are brothers and sisters now and then continuing on for all eternity, rejoicing with them. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Thank you for Jesus Christ our Lord, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. <clears throat>
the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this opportunity to come and share and our remembrance of the Lord and his death until he comes again. And may that day be soon. All hail the name of Jesus. Amen.